Welcome everyone to AURI Connects Webinar Wednesday, part of AURI Connects monthly online series, featuring updates on the work that AURI is doing to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. I'm Dan Skogan, the AURI Director of Government Operations and your host to Webinar Wednesdays. The AURI Connects program is hosted by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute in Minnesota. This program aims to actively engage all participants in the food and egg industry to improve competitiveness of producers, businesses, and entrepreneurs through ongoing purposeful connection of resources and partners along the value chain and increase knowledge of opportunities, technologies, and trends. Remember that this event is being recorded and archived and can be found at eurai.org. Today, we'll be hearing from food loss expert, Dr. Claire Sand of Packaging Technology and Research, as we look for ways to reduce food loss and waste in Minnesota food processing, while exploring new uses for the remaining food waste. Remember, you are and will remain muted, but we will be answering your questions at the end of her presentation. So send us your questions through the Q&A portal. Before we hear from Dr. Sand today, Jason Robinson, AURI's Business Development Director of Food, will offer some perspective on how we got to this point in the food loss and waste discussion here in Minnesota. Jason? Thanks so much, Dan. This project work that Dan has just referenced was funded through AURI's Competitive Ag Innovation Partnership Program, which is meant to catalyze innovation, generate new ideas, and support partnerships in value-added agriculture. Every year, AURI puts forth a number of challenges to solicit work in areas that we consider dormant or that may be needing additional research. The project Dr. Sand will discuss was built around a mapping and analysis of new value chain opportunities in Minnesota food loss and waste. Claire will dive into significantly more detail, but I wanted to take a moment to highlight the two key takeaways that we as an organization discovered from this work. The first is that since its inception in 1989, AURI has been working in the food loss and waste space through our co-products focus area. In essence, we just haven't been using this terminology. The aha moment for AURI was when we re really and truly recognized the impact of our 30 years in existence in the FLW space. The second key takeaway was that opportunities to reduce food, lace, food loss and waste exist up and down the value chain, but they need a sponsor to bring them to fruition. AURI, through this work, has a well-defined role in the food loss and waste space and can support commercialization of these ideas but we can't draw, drive those ideas to commercialization. That's where we need a sponsor to come in and provide the support. So with that, I will turn it over to Dr. Claire Sand to walk us through the research project that she conducted on our behalf for the remainder of this webinar. Thank you. Thanks, Jason. And boy, I, I really like you, like how you set the stage there. And uh, this project really focused on building the business case for food loss and waste and really focusing on what's needed for stakeholder engagement. So um, thanks for your time. And thank you to AURI for funding this project. It was a part of an AIP project, as Jason mentioned. Uh, it's been fun and uh, we love to do this type of thing. So this is a little bit about me. Basically, I've been passionate about food loss and waste since the mid 1980s, and I focus on food loss and waste prevention via packaging, as well as food science and processing. This is uh, some of the projects that my company works on. This is our project team, and boy, they were amazing. Uh, the, as you can see, it was a blend of AURI expertise as well as PTR. So in particular with AURI, it was Alan, and uh, Ashley, Jason, and Michael in alphabetical order here, not in order of importance. 
So this is the agenda we're, that we're going to be covering today. I'm going to talk through food loss and waste as a concept and why it was so important to AURI with this AIP, AIP project, a project summary, some at a glance results. Uh, when I go through these at a glance results, it's important to realize that, boy, there was a lot of information, spreadsheet upon spreadsheet, and we've condensed it here for you. So if you do have any questions, please reach out to AURI. And though I'm just going to wrap up by the potential to reduce food loss and waste in Minnesota. So let's talk through um, why, why food loss and waste and why is, it, why is it even relevant? Well, we lose about 30 to 40% of what's produced. Uh, it's either wasted or it's lost. And we'll talk about the difference in a, in a few minutes. But it has a tremendous dollar impact for stakeholders uh, such as brands and uh, like big brands in Minnesota, but also for farms, consumers, and retailers. And we'll talk about the value chain and how the value chain can be used to really identify stakeholders, but also to build the business case. And it is very different from one project to another. So one of the big takeaways of this is food loss and waste is avoidable. Uh, and it also relates to food access, which many of you may be in the policy area, and that relates to a lot of food access issues. So when we talk through solutions for food waste, uh, it's we, we need to engage uh, or think about where food loss is and where food waste is. So if you look at the bottom here, we basically have agricultural production. So if you think of that as farms and harvesting, processing, uh, which may be likely done, it could be ingredient processing, but it could be very well done by a brand uh, who combines a bunch of different ingredients and there's food loss uh, there. And then in the food waste realm, we think of that as distribution and retail, restaurants, catering, and that could include fast food restaurants, and then consumption. So that's consumers. And the supply chain solutions are actually different, as you may think, to decrease food waste uh, and loss. And each solution actually needs its own business case uh, because we can, um, we can motivate uh, differently within the entire value chain. Sorry, I'm having trouble advancing slides here. Uh, this is the EPA diagram, and this diagram is something something that uh, we focus a lot on in the food loss and waste spectrum. And we're going to take just a minute and explore uh, what, what this is in the AURI context and what it means for us who are concerned about food loss and waste. So at the top, we have more opportunities and more environmental impact when we reduce food loss and waste, and that's source reduction. You can also think of this as food waste prevention. So AURI thinks about this in the context of co-products for human consumption. And AURI focuses a lot on farms and processors. So that's the AURI component in terms of food waste prevention. As we move down, we also see a lot of food waste diversion. And so we're lowering the, 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 the difference we can make and in terms of the lowering the the difference in the environmental impact of food waste as we go down the pyramid. So by preventing food waste at the top, we can make more of an environmental impact. As we go down to the bottom, we make less of one. So by diverting food waste into animal feed, as opposed to preventing food waste for human consumption, it's farther on down the, the pyramid, but it's still extremely relevant. PT or uh, AURI uses this for co-products for animal consumption. And we did identify um, some, some uh, solutions in that area. The other thing that AURI works on in the space is industrial uses. So AURI does work in the bio-derived energy uh, phase. And we did identify some waste to energy um, uh, solutions. This is some examples of some projects. And uh, recently, there was uh, some 
uh, quotations and where AURI basically steps in to add value to prevent food processing waste from occurring. So these are some of the recent projects that AURI has worked on in the co-products realm, picking up on the thoughts that Jason shared that AURI has been working in this space and under co-products um, co for uh, animal consumption, but also in the waste to energy space. Uh, this project really focused on um, identifying food loss and waste solutions for selected products in Minnesota. And we partnered with AURI, AURI to assist in developing the focus for AURI and developing a path forward on how they could really begin to expand and begin to understand their context within reducing food loss and waste in Minnesota. So we explored the traditional role of source reduction, uh, animal feed and industrial reuses, and then also explored expanding that for AURI. Let's talk through the project in more detail now. Basically, there were three steps. The first step was we determined what products to explore, and we did this using a rubric uh, that we developed with the AURI team. Uh, as you can imagine, there's, oh boy, a lot of products in Minnesota to choose from. And so what we wanted to do was show a healthy variety of projects, uh, products, but we also wanted to show differences in the value chain. So the products are very different and we'll talk through some of them. Uh, but then we also wanted to make sure they had significant um, uh, production in Minnesota. For example, we didn't do pineapples because we tend not to grow pineapples in Minnesota unless it's in a greenhouse. The second thing we did was quantify food loss and waste throughout the value chain to derive co-product packaging, processing, and system solutions. So we identified and then quantified in terms of the dollar impact of about 280 uh, viable process product and packaging and system solutions in the value chain. And boy, this re resulted in a lot of, a lot of pounds <laughs> for uh, just seven uh, Minnesota products. Then what we did as a team is we said, well, let's talk through all of these solutions. And we didn't do it all in one day because that would have been a major conversation. <laughs> so we did it in a couple of days. And 12 of the 287 solutions were explored for a deep dive by the team to really assess feasibility and refine solutions. So we'll be talking through those solutions with you today. So here's the net uh, that Jason has highlighted a little bit. This is a little bit more detail. Uh, there is a lot of opportunity and AURI does have the potential to expand food loss and waste, but need a sponsor to commercial, commercialize it. And the next steps with many of these are really to uh, get people who, are in, who want to engage with it. It could be a, a, a new business entrepreneur or it could be an existing stakeholder. So let's go through a summary of this. Um, so we're going to uh, go through some of the products in, in a minute, but the first thing that people look at with this and they say, oh boy, look at, look at all these, these colors here. <laughs> but we're going to be talking about the seven products listed on the bottom here from canned corn to unsaleable milk at retail. And we'll talk through those in detail. So basically we have a couple different sections. Uh, there are four different sections really. We'll talk about cider, and then we'll talk about canned corn. And then we'll talk about unsaleable milk at retail and cheese at retail. And then we'll talk about um, uh, small, small cheese processors. But as you can see with these, the amount of food waste is very different within each area. For example, in cider, we have a lot of food waste really happening at the farm. So that's apples right? Uh, we also, when you look at canned kidney beans, well, boy, we only have about nine or 10% uh, uh, food waste occurring at, uh, at the farms. And most of the food waste actually occurs in the hands of the consumer for canned kidney beans. Not true for uh, cider. The first thing that people look at when they look at this is they get all excited. What are these consumers doing? This is the, the food waste that we found when we looked at these products. Uh, excluded in here though are unsaleable milk and cheese and sugar beets because that would skew the results because we just looked at uh, retail with unsaleable milk and cheese and with sugar beets we just looked at the farm. So those are excluded but in, a, in general we do see high amounts of food waste associated with consumers 
And when we take a step back and we think about that, and we think about wanting to achieve a more sustainable food system, well, that product has already gone through distribution. It's been grown by farms, it's been manufactured, and consumers have paid for it, and then it goes to waste. So that's a real uh, tragedy. So let's go through the products in more detail. This is uh, an eye chart. In my experience, every presentation need, needs one. Uh, these are the details we're gonna be talking through. When I talk about food loss and waste numbers, uh, we base that on uh, Minnesota, of course. So we use the Minnesota Department of Agriculture and USDA data on the actual volumes of products grown in Minnesota. And then we juxtapose that with the refed food loss and waste values, uh, which were also based on EPA data. And so you can see in this chart here, uh, varying amounts of food loss and waste. And we'll talk through some of those. And then we also see in the third column on the right, uh, we see the number of solutions. So we did one deep dive out of 67 solutions for canned corn. We did two deep dives for canned kidney beans. For wine, no deep dives, but 81 solutions were identified. Let's talk through cider. Uh, I'm going to spend a little bit more time talking through cider uh, because the rest of the charts are really uh, follow the same type of format. So what you see here in the upper right is the EPA hierarchy. Uh, love that. So much easier to uh, so easy so easy to explain. So we have most preferred on the top and least preferred on the bottom, but all reduce food loss and waste. So all are good. So right here in CIDR, we're going to be focusing on one solution, which is vision sorting of bad apples. So you can see that in the upper left. And so that is actually preventing food waste. So that's a really uh, good one in terms of environmental impact. And so we'll talk about that one in more detail. For each one of these, we have uh, different categories. We have different um, uh, things explained like opportunity size, alignment, feasibility in the lower right hand corner and the categories are arranged in the same order. The interesting thing to think about with apples and with cider in general is we started with 42 solutions and we narrowed it down to this one which is vision sorting of bad apples and the next one related to patulin. And um, with apples, what's really interesting about them is in some seasons, uh, let's say for some years, for example, 2012, we had unusually warm weather in March, followed by a hard frost in April, killed a lot of apple blossoms. A few months later, thousands of apples were left on the trees, they were damaged from summertime hail, drought, and it was a loss of about 40% of the apple crop. Not a great year, right, for the apple, uh, for the apple business. And some of the solutions then need to be resilient because one year we could have really good apple season, but then the next year uh, it wouldn't be that good. Oh, sorry, I need to go back here. So um, let's talk about this in, in more detail. So the opportunity here is 20 to 30% loss of, um, loss of or addressing 20 to 30% of food waste for apples. We can implement vision systems to rapidly sort apples to control mold spreading and patulin development, which we'll talk about in a second. And we can link this uh, with the patulin uh, removal. Uh, patulin is actually a toxin and apples with patulin are not consumable. However, they can be isolated with vision sorting and used in apple cider. Uh, an alcoholic, uh, produ in al alcoholic production since fermentation actually destroys the patulin. What's interesting is the vision sorting actually reduces a lot of food waste. Uh, 20 to 30 percent is, is very high. And one of the reasons is that the, the old adage of one bad apple spoils the whole bunch is actually true because patulin will spread from one apple to another. So if we vision sort out the bad apples, then they can't actually spread to the other apples. The graphs on the lower right here are really in a relative scale. So when we look at feasibility, it's easy to achieve. Vision sorting has been used in the food industry for a long time, and it has been applied to apples, but applying it in a higher amount is actually what's needed here to reduce food waste. Uh, the second area is AUR alignment. 
A or I, you know, this this is uh, within their capabilities. Uh, they wouldn't necessarily develop the the uh, the vision systems. They would help uh, farmers apply those vision systems. The uh, opportunity size is also medium size, and then we can also see the stakeholders and funding sources. When we look at patchland removal, which we talked a little bit about, uh, it's also source reduction somewhere between the the farm and the manufacturing because it's you know the patchland removal is actually facilitated by processing. Same type of format on this, this slide. Again, massive amounts of food waste reduction. The reason that feasibility is low in the lower right-hand corner is that it's really not um, something that AURI um, would be able to do. Uh, they're not in the alcoholic <laughs> cider production um, uh, area. And there's also complications uh, to implement patchland removal fermentation technology. There's food processing management, there's HACCP uh, or hazard analysis critical control points that would have to be implemented. And we would really need to make sure that there's a separate stream. That is, if we are going to uh, have apples containing patchland going to be made into cider, we would need to ensure that apples uh, that for cider, for cider for fermentation, we would need to make sure that that stream does not contaminate another stream that is not slated for fermentation. So feasibility uh, is low for those reasons. Uh, we're gonna shift then a little bit uh, into one that's uh, quite different, and this is canned kidney beans, and then we're going to talk uh, about canned cans uh, in general after that. So when we look at uh, food loss and waste prevention, we see where the uh, opportunity lies in this specific case. And this one is quite interesting because food loss and waste prevention can be done by making co-products from broken and uncannibal solids and from wastewater screening and ultrafiltration. The interesting thing about this in terms of the business case is it's built by reducing the BOD or the, um, the, uh, the aerobic bacteria within the water. And so BOD is a measure of the amount of oxygen required to remove waste and organic ma matter from water. It's in the, in the process of decomposition by an aerobic bacteria, BOD is actually used. And so often wastewater treatment plants use this index uh, as a degree of organic uh, quote unquote pollution in the water. So right now, uh, disposal of uh, BOD and uh, water that's quote unquote polluted from food manufacturing is very expensive and has a big environmental impact. So by combining and straining and screening and using ultrafiltration of that BOD, we can actually just have water that's more clean released, less of environmental impact and less costs. So this disposal savings was not captured within these food loss and waste uh, values, uh, but can be used to build the business case. And we need an, an economic analysis as noted here in the next steps to uh, really assess the viability of wastewater disposal, the BOD load, the tipping fees or the disposal fees, and the amount of solids and wastewater and the bean pieces available. The graph in the lower right shows high alignment with AURI and a high degree of opportunity. Uh, we're still in canned food, and so this is canned food in general. Uh, this is an example of how, with, these, uh, with this presentation, we want to, to explore different areas of the value chain. So if you reflect back on that, oh boy, look at that big, a high number with <laughs> consumer food waste. We see a similar uh, profile here with canned foods. And so this particular uh, solution was to specifically address consumer derived food waste. Uh, and it was a resealable lid for this. Uh, so 
Um, it's not, uh, it's way up the value chain, uh, a resealable kind of made in Minnesota, a reusable lid for cans. It's not uncommon. It's out there in industry. So feasibility is very high. Uh, those of you with, who with, uh, have cats uh, may have seen this for cat food and it's used as a promotion from some of the brands. But it's really very low alignment with AURI. Uh, AURI does have expertise with packaging, but not really in this realm. Uh, the opportunity size is very high, but this is an example of, it's not really within AURI's core competency, but if there was uh, a stakeholder interested, they would be able to engage. And the opportunity is extremely high because we do have a lot of canned foods in Minnesota. So we're going to shift gears again. So we've talked about cider and we've talked about canning, and now we're going to deal with unsaleable milk and cheese at retail. So I grouped both of these together because the solutions are really very similar. So retail is an area that we haven't really discussed so far in this presentation. Uh, what's really interesting about retail food waste is that uh, it's quite sad, right? Uh, because we often throw out the package as well as the product. Uh, there is separation technology, which we'll talk about, but uh, we really, when we think about the world and what we're trying to do with decreasing plastic or packaging waste uh, and food waste, the two are really combined here. And that's why it's quite sad. We'll be talking through three options. The first chopped option deals with encode cheese or milk used as a food. So it's higher up on the food uh, loss waste pyramid, the EPA pyramid, and so it's food waste prevention. The second option we'll talk about is out of code cheese or milk, and we'll be separating the food from the package uh, and disposing or recycling of the packaging and using the cheese as animal feed as opposed to option one, where we would use it as human feed or human, human food. Uh, so it's this, this uh, second option is diversion. And we'll talk through these in a second. Uh, the third option then is, uh, is really waste to energy. And this is something that AURI does have a core competency and experience in, and we'll, and we'll talk through that. What's really interesting about these is they all have very different business cases because they, are, they deal with different stakeholders throughout the value chain. So let's talk through option number one. Uh, this is the highest business case. And well, you know, it's kind of the most work too. <laughs> so uh, basically it's human food products recovered that are not past code, right? So the, they're still within their shelf life. Uh, and this includes fat recapture, cottage cheese, paneer, and uh, milk powder co-products that could be made. Uh, we can use existing equipment to remove the milk, in this case, uh, from the recyclable or non-recyclable packaging. So the packaging could be disposed of separately, um, it could be waste to energy, it could be landfill, it could be compostable. Uh, but the, the key then is to remove the milk from the package in an economically desirable way. The next step on this is really an economic analysis of the viability of capturing out-of-code unsaleable milk or sorry, in code, unsaleable milk for human food ingredients. We also need to assess uh, the existing uh, machinery and make sure it's adapted for FSMA and HACCP and general food safety. And AURI co-products expertise can be used. And there's a lot of funding available with AIP and RCDG. The next section here is to produce animal feed. So we're going down on the uh, EPA hierarchy. This is very high uh, AURI alignment. It's very similar to the previous example, previous solution we talked about. The only difference is that this is out of code. Um, it's unsaleable milk uh, because it is out of code. The interesting thing is here is that the animal feed industry is highly involved, obviously, as a key stakeholder. And uh, we also have uh, key stakeholders in terms of equipment developers and engineering firms to separate out that packaging from the, uh, from the product. 
And likewise, next steps, uh, same type of thing uh, related to food safety. So again, high opportunity size, high AURI alignment, and high feasibility. Uh, this addresses about 5% food loss and waste. So when you think about um, the other food loss and waste percentages we talked about, it's important to keep that in perspective. The last section that we can talk about, and all three of these uh, options, the uh, human co-products, animal feed co-products, and waste energy are also for unsaleable cheese with very similar numbers. Waste energy of packaging and milk. Boy, that sounds kind of strange, but actually um, milk is packaged in high density polyethylene jugs and plastic has a lot of BTUs in it. And so if it is not economically desirable uh, or possible, uh, or if those co-products uh, cannot be actually developed because of FSMA or HACCP constraints, we can actually gain energy from uh, the combined packaging and milk. And AURI does have uh, core competency in this uh, area. Bio bioreactors would be the key stakeholders, as would landfillers and uh, municipal solid waste handlers who want to decrease the amount of food that goes into landfills. So those are the three examples uh, with uh, unsaleable milk and cheese. The third example, or the, the, the uh, last area that we want to go through as an example of the, the value chain and, and the areas we addressed is small-scale dairies. And boy, that's pretty interesting. Um, we do have a lot of uh, differences in the value chain for small-scale dairies versus uh, large-scale dairies. Large-scale dairies have setups uh, for handling a lot of um, a lot of their co-products and, and things. For example, whey protein isolates are used heavily in the industry from byproducts of cheese production or whey. But small-scale dairies may not have the volume of whey to facilitate sending it to a, a large whey protein isolate manufacturer, uh, or it would not be economically desirable. Better to have uh, a small-scale value chain for these small-scale dairies. So we explored this and there's a the interesting analogy or thing to think about is we do have a lot of small scale value chains within the system within the food processing system that really need their own uh, value chain separate from the large scale uh, systems that we have highly developed. So production of human whey based co-products is an obvious one. Uh, we did capture some research that was done in Spain on this uh, addressing these specific issues. When we look at all the different co-products under there, uh, when we look at the details of the solutions, we can see them all. Um, and uh, some of them, uh, I guess I haven't had lunch yet, and some of them sound, sound pretty good. <laughs> but um, the AURI uh, co-products expertise can really help out here. It's high alignment with AURI, high opportunity size, just simply because we produce so much whey uh, when we make cheese. Um, the long timeline is associated with that is because building this infrastructure and really identifying the key equipment and engineering firms uh, to, to refine this is needed and that just simply takes time. So I wanted to talk just uh, a bit uh, because um, I wanted to make sure I conveyed that there's a lot of potential to reduce food loss and waste in Minnesota. We just addressed seven products throughout the value chain and really expo explored where, um, where we can have solutions that are AURI adaptable, like with co-products and waste to energy, and ones that don't really align with AURI's core competencies, such as lids on cans. And so it's not doom and gloom. The prospects are very high for Minnesota. Uh, AURI is an excellent partner, and there are also other initiatives, for example, the recent MBOLD initiatives that re relate to reducing food waste and increasing shelf life. Uh, I'm not saying that we won't have food waste in the future. When I got into the food waste realm, uh, I was 
fascinated that we lost 30% of the food that we produced on the planet. And while well, that number is about the same, there was a recent EU study uh, done on that. Uh, however, where we lose it and how we lose it and the environmental impact of its loss is actually changing. So there's a lot of opportunity to reduce food waste in the future. Uh, there's also a lot of opportunity to combine that with food access. For example, there's a lot of innovations going on with designing food and packaging to meet specific needs, such as uh, the needs of uh, food shelves or the needs of rural versus urban environments. And uh, again, we were talking about small, small value chains, small scale value chains versus large scale values value chains. So I do believe that a more sustainable food system is really on its way. The future is bright. We have food, really excellent food policy taking shape and excellent food science and packaging science that we can uh, capture. So please reach out to AURI and uh, I'd like to thank the AURI uh, AIP program for supporting this work and to the a AURI team, again in alphabetical order, Al, Ashley, Jason, and Michael, and the PTR team of Zinet and Katie. Thank you for your time. Thank you, Dr. Sand. And uh, if you'll hang around, we'll uh, see if there are some questions. If you are in your Zoom room, uh, you should have access to a Q&A portal or tab, and you can ask uh, questions there. Um, Dr. Sand, uh, I think in, in one of your early slides, there was 280 some uh, products uh, grown, processed in Minnesota. Uh, you picked six or seven. How did you, how did you come to those six or seven? Was there a, a method there that uh, that you guys used to uh, to get there? That's a good question. Uh, we did have a very extensive rubric. Uh, I think on the rubric there were uh, at least fifteen or so different rows with the with uh, and and columns and and things like that to to analyze it. Uh, some of it was based on wanting to do variety. Right, so we had apples, uh, and then we also had milk. Uh, we had sugar beets in there just peripherally, uh, but you know, uh, some of some products were screened out, such as sugar beets, because frankly, the sugar beets industry has done such a great job at uh, reducing food waste. Uh, so some of them we screened out because the opportunity wasn't really there. Uh, the food loss and waste was quite low. Uh, but we also wanted to explore products uh, with a healthy variety. Uh, so we did beans and then we did apples and, 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 um, and uh, corn and milk and cheese and things like that. Uh, and then we also wanted to explore when we did the deep dive, we wanted to explore different areas of the value chain to give AURI a pretty healthy perspective of how they can relate to different stakeholders in the value chain. Uh, Dr. Sand, are you aware of the upcycling food movement or more specifically the Upcycled Food Association? Oh, great people. Yeah, love the name, right? I mean, what, you know, is, is fantastic. And, uh, you know, because I, I, one of the things uh, when I saw that name, uh, I said, boy, people know exactly what that is. So they did a great job with the name selection. Uh, yes, I am um, not involved with it specifically. It's my understanding they're working on the definition of upcycled food, which I think is extremely important. Uh, there's a lot of um, noise, there's a lot of interest in really decreasing food waste. But we all need to say, what is it, right? And then we can and, and uh, agree on the definition of what is upcycling uh, and what is an actual upcycled food. For example, in the EPA pyramid, upcycled foods for human consumption are at the top. As we move down the pyramid, um, are upcycled foods for animal consumption? Are they upcycled foods? I'm not sure. Uh, and then we also have diversion in there, uh, which is, um, as, we, as, we, as we've talked about, uh, less, of a, um, less environmentally friendly. But if we can't upcycle the food, either to human or to animal feed, then those are excellent solutions to reduce the environmental impact of food waste. And it looks like we had a follow-up uh, there that uh, the definition is complete. They're now working on a certification, apparently. Uh, another Excellent. question says, uh, has, any thought, uh, has any thought to agricultural overproduction be ev been evaluated? 
Uh, that was not within the scope of this project, but that is interesting. Um, that, yeah, I, I have worked on that in the past, but that was not within the scope of this project. That is a fascinating area uh, because it also involves food policy, as, as many of you in agriculture know. And I know you talked some on the uh, milk and, and cheese that was unsaleable at retail. Is anyone right now separating that packaging and product? Uh, I don't know specifically for milk and cheese, but uh, there was, um, and I'm, I'm my packaging news, uh, I don't remember the actual source, but uh, in Western Michigan, they are uh, dividing up. They are, they are opening up packet. They have machinery that's installed to actually open up packaging and separate it out. And that is done at a material recycling facility or like a MRF. Uh, and the express purpose is to decrease the amount of food waste that goes into landfills. And, and I believe they're actually diverting that to more of a waste to energy uh, or uh, composting. Uh, that that food waste and then the packaging is disposed of in a landfill or is recycled. But yes, it, it's um, I'm sure there are other examples throughout the United States and throughout the world, but that one is a recent uh, example. Also, um, Dr. San, can you elaborate on hurdles that reduce the ease of upcycling? Is it packaging, transportation, logistics? Can you put your finger on it? Um, to increase the ease of upcycling? Uh, elaborate on hurdles that reduce the ease of upcycling. Hmm. I'm going to go ahead and say it's increased the ease, <laughs> which I hope is uh, you know, the, the intent. Um, okay. that's, a, that's a good question. Uh, I think one of the things which is really hard to get our heads around, and, and uh, the AORI team brought it up uh, specifically related to the apples, is that, uh, boy, we can't always count on losing 40% of our apples every year, nor do we want to, right? right. So when you, if you want a co-product that's reliable, which the food industry needs, that they can source, that's consistent, and, and all those other types of things, um, because that's how our food system is, is set up, is for consistency, not for agility, um, that's really hard. If you're, if you're relying on food waste from farms to always be 40%, because again, we don't want that and we can't rely on the weather to always be bad, right? So that's, that's hard. And so for that reason, we need to build in agility uh, within our food systems. And we did see that when, when companies, uh, companies, some companies now, depending on the price uh, of things, they will switch from high fructose corn syrup to sugar uh, formulas based on prices. And so we do have that ability to have agility, but I think if we want to use upcycled foods, uh, then uh, we need to build that agility into the system. And uh, they, they said, yes, you understood the question correctly, even if it wasn't worded uh, quite correctly. Uh, very good. A uh, couple more here before we uh, turn you loose today. Could you elaborate on waste to energy as an FLW mitigation strategy, especially through uh, anaerobic digestion? Yeah, um, that uh, again is at the bottom of the pyramid or, or right above landfill. Right, so not a great option. Uh, there's a there's a lot of uh, people in the packaging industry specifically working on this, and that specific example of waste to energy was actually disposing of the packaging at the same time as the product. So it was not actually separating it out, uh, but that that could very well be done, and then you could get into you know, digestion of, of um, you know, the, the food itself. Um, that example was provided because uh, it, that would be used if it was not economically desirable to separate the product and the package. So basically, we're talking about getting the BTUs um, out, of, out of it, waste energy uh, incineration, as opposed to uh, what most people would think of as uh, composting. And you showed a couple of slides where uh, consumers uh, were uh, part of the, uh, a big part of the food waste. Did you, were you able to come to some conclusions on why that was? Why are we losing so much at the consumer level? 
Yeah, that that number has unfortunately stayed the same, and uh, for for quite a while, quite well since since the nineteen eighties. Um, uh, that that's a very hard question to answer. I, I wish I, I could get into the minds of consumers. Uh, one of the reasons, though, is I, I think we need to take a step back and think about how we package for consumers. We talk a lot about. Uh, at least in packaging, we talk a lot about consumer convenience, portability, shareability, openability, all that type of stuff. But we don't talk uh, very much about well, keepability. You know, <laughs> like let's make sure that thing lasts a long. Let's make sure that product, whatever it is, lasts a long time once the consumer opens the package. Or um, a major initiative with uh, you know Save Food and um, the National Resource Defense Council with uh, you know the the changing in the dating systems uh, about so consumers don't know the difference between use by sell by uh, best if used by you know things like that so clearing up those dating systems I think will really help a lot and uh, it's my understanding that uh, industry is voluntarily uh, moving. Uh, in the right direction there. Uh, so that should help quite a bit. So one of the big causes is uh, the dating, the open, the uh, open, it's called open dating of, of foods. So that will hopefully change. But I also think we need to look at uh, really cool technologies that we can use to extend the shelf life of foods once the package has been opened. Uh, for example, can lids, or that's a simple solution. But there are other um, really high-tech ones that are out there. Well, and maybe piggybacking on that, uh, we have a question here that asks if there was any alternative packaging considered during the study, like maybe hemp to help reduce FLW? Oh, that's interesting. Um, that's interesting because when we back up and we think of what we're trying to achieve why re by reducing food waste, we want to achieve a more sustainable food system, which also involves more sustainable packaging. So less food waste with more sustainable packaging would be the ideal. Hemp, you know, is, is bio-derived, just like uh, trees are bio-derived and some bioplastics are, or bio-derived bio plastics are bio-derived. And so the use of hemp wouldn't necessarily uh, decrease food waste, right? But we may be able to um, use uh, better barrier technology, uh, which may include, include hemp uh, or a layer of hemp uh, to protect the food and then we would have less food waste. Or in the example that uh, somebody just brought up with the waste to energy uh, incineration, if the hemp was used to package uh, the say cheese or milk. Uh, I'm not sure what a hemp-based um, plastic jug would look like, but that could be interesting. Um, and then uh, we could actually perhaps put that in a bio, um, you know, digester and, and things like that. Uh, that, based on the technology that's available now, would be mm, a stretch to, to package milk that way and, and things like that. But um, we have to be very careful though when we try to reduce packaging waste and reduce food waste at the same time. Uh, both uh, are really mm, distinct. And in some cases we can reduce packaging waste, but oh boy, then food waste goes up really high. Sometimes we can reduce food waste, but then we have to use a lot more packaging. Um, so it's a balance. Uh, in, in there. It does appear there are a lot of opportunities, and if you'll forgive the pun, uh, what's some of the low-hanging fruit, or, or what are some of the next steps that you envision coming out of this study? Uh, one of the big next steps is uh, shareholders getting interest, or sorry, uh, stakeholders getting interested and realizing that there are opportunities. Um, somebody uh, famous, I'm actually not sure who it was, said there's a lot of money in waste, you know, and so uh, these are these could be entrepreneurs that are willing to uh, you know for example develop machinery that can separate uh, plastic jugs milk jugs from 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 milk uh, in a safe uh, manner using um, you know FISMA guidelines and HACCP guidelines so that we could go ahead and use that milk uh, to make other products uh, and then repackage it and then use the 
the packaging and dispose of the packaging properly. So there's a lot of opportunities for stakeholders, including retailers and, and things like that, to really engage in the food waste space. And so I'm a firm believer in many ideas and many, many people and many value chain stakeholders make light work. So the next step is to um, really, uh, you know, try to try to fuel uh, people getting engaged and realize that, uh, you know, businesses can actually be created from food waste. And AUI has done a, a great job in leading in that area with co-products. Our guest today has been Dr. Claire Sand. And uh, Dr. Sand, I want to thank you for your time today and a very informative presentation. Thank you. That concludes AURI Connect's webinar Wednesday for today, presented by the Agricultural Utilization Research Institute of Minnesota. AURI's mission is to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. Now, in October, we will have another look at the hemp report that came out nearly a year ago. This presentation is also part of the AURI Connect's Fields of Innovation. This platform focuses on bringing together Minnesota's ag and food value chains around new and emerging crops. Events focus on highlighting promising new crops, examining market opportunities for emerging crops, and highlighting new technologies in existing crops. Please join AURI Business Development Director Harold Stanislavski and AURI Engineer Riley Gordon on October 14th for a presentation on the current state of the industrial hemp industry in Minnesota, and opportunities surrounding hemp fiber, food, and feed. They will also briefly touch on AURI's ongoing involvement with a research study on cannabinoid levels in crops around the state. That's October 14th from noon till one, and you can register right now at auri.org slash webinar Wednesday.